Astra is a fascinating rocket company that has had some great successes and some unfortunate failures. They're bouncing back with a brand new, bigger rocket and improved manufacturing and quality control. In this video, we'll get a detailed look at their new rocket, which they call Rocket 4. We'll talk to their CEO, Chris Kemp, their Vice President of Manufacturing, Bryson Gentile, and we'll try to learn exactly how they plan to manufacture Rocket 4 at scale. And manufacture at scale is exactly what they set up to do. They've built an assembly line designed to churn out a rocket a day, which is nuts. But is that even possible? What has to be done on a company level in order to enable such rapid production of such a complex thing? Let's take a look. So today we're going to show you a couple of cool things. We're going to show you how raw material becomes a rocket through the factory. So last time you were here, we started from our front lobby. This time we're going to start from our receiving door, which is where the action in the factory begins. Excellent. So parts go in that door, rockets go out another door. Raw materials and parts come in a door right behind us over here, and then rockets go out the, the other side of the factory. Awesome. So what you see on the, on the rack behind us, uh, this is a whole bunch of raw material. So one of the nice things about being a vertically integrated company is we actually understand the sizes of parts that we traditionally make. So we stock a lot of material that's in common diameters or shapes in long bars. And these bars are actually wider than the door, the receiving door is. So we store them outside and we actually bring them, if you follow me, uh, we bring them over here. Uh, we have a cutting area. So the factory actually begins outside of the walls of the factory. I like it. Um, and uh, this machine over here, it's called the cold saw. So we take these bars, we bring them over here, we forklift them over, and then we ch cut off little sections, little slugs of material. And then we take those and we bring them into the machine shop and then parts start their journey here from these large bars, which we produce at a much lower cost uh, than buying little small bricks. Um, so we'll hop actually over this barrier. This is not normally a tour friendly path. So we'll hop over this barrier uh, and then we'll walk into the factory here. So we walked up the ramp past the aforementioned receiving door and into the factory proper. I was immediately blown away by the increased scale of everything. At a very high level, uh, since we've been on our last tour video, a number of things have changed here. Inventory is double the size it was before. Uh, the shop, which we're about to jump into, is about triple the square footage of what it was before. And this factory overall is almost triple the square footage of what that last, last tour contained. Well, last factory tour, you said we have all this space to expand into. And now it's very clear you have, you have done exactly that. Yes, uh, all going according to plan since the early days of looking at this building and kind of having a vision of how it could come together. You know, we've been executing um, as, we've, as we've expected. Um, a lot of these pieces of equipment are very specialized uh, for rockets. Uh, actually, many of them are not as well. We prefer the ones that are not because they're easily available. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can walk you through uh, some of this as we, as we walk through the place. Cool, should we put on our handy dandy eye protection? Yes, uh, thank you. So let's put on our safety glasses and jump right into the shop. Safety first. So uh, we're entering the shop right now. The shop is controlled to a tighter temperature window than the rest of the facility. Uh, and that allows us to make sure that as we're machining parts, uh, the machines and the parts themselves are expanding and contracting with temperature um, at a known rate. So we can always hit very, very tight tolerances here in the shop. Um, so those strip doors are actually mostly just to keep a temperature controlled environment. Makes sense. We're gonna pop into the sheet metal shop um, and we'll start the journey uh, for a sheet metal part here. So uh, very similar to the last time we came through, uh, parts show up on the sheet metal rack, um, or raw material shows up on the sheet metal rack, uh, then gets loaded into the water jet. We cut flat patterns, and then those, maybe I'll just grab a prop here instead of uh, waving my hands around. I love that you have a, a handy prop case. Oh yeah, so I came through here enough times uh, that uh, Scott, uh, who is right over here, uh, speaking with a couple folks in the shop, actually decided he was gonna make me a display case uh, so that I didn't have to keep asking him for things. Nice. <laughs> uh, so that's us iterating live. <laughs> <laughs> um, but these are a couple examples of parts that started their life as sheet parts. So these were flat sheets uh, that we then cut and then brake formed uh, on the brake press there. So these are uh, parts essentially formed to be able to get stiffness. Um, this particular part started its life originally as a machined part. Um, and is now a brake form part that is lighter and higher performing than the machine part it replaced. And if you're not machining it, you don't have to lose a bunch of material to that process. You're, you have the material, you're using it, you're not throwing away a bunch of material. Exactly. Uh, machine parts, I used to think were quite cool. They are now deeply offensive to me because you throw away generally uh, most of what you paid for when you're making a machined part. So these sheet metal parts, you use a lot of the material you paid for. So you get um, low cost uh, parts and they also 
these particular styles of manufacturing, brake forming, um, is uh, very high utilization and very low cycle time. It uh, means you're putting not that much money uh, in the time that you invest into the part, so you can make these uh, very easily to be scaled up um, at very low cost. All right, the machine shop was pretty similar to the last time we had a tour, but that's where the similarities end. As we moved on, Bryson once again underscored how big the changes to the factory have been. As we get into the next part of the tour, we're passing by a, basically a bunch of active machines in the machine shop, so please forgive any less than perfect audio. So now we're entering uh, kind of the main part of the machine shop, and what we would have seen previously is a curtain at that first kind of set of columns. Uh, when we were here last time. Right, it's like double the size now. Yeah, yeah. So the shop actually uh, used to end right over that VTL by column B2. Yep. We've actually expanded all the way up to that last wall. Uh, so the overall square footage of the shop is almost triple uh, wow. what it was before. And we'll walk you through um, how we've expanded and how that's changed the, the shop and its arrangement here. Cool. So let's get going. And as we get into the shop, um, what you see first is a lot of manual machines. So we do a lot of quick turn sort of development work and the manual machines and the semi-manual, semi-automated machines are really handy for that. They don't take a lot of programming time, not a lot of setup time. Um, this is an area uh, that's really important to us, particularly for development, and we need to do really, really rapid iterations, maybe a part turnaround in a couple of hours, yep. uh, rather than days or weeks. Yeah, so that makes sense. The manual shop is kind of the first entry as you as you walk in here. What are, what are we doing over here? What are we doing over here? That's a good question. Hey, Dave, uh, what are you making? Uh, balancing uh, locks rotor. So bearing simulators for balancing the locks rotor, that's the first stage engine. Correct. Yeah, so Dave's working on some first stage engine parts. That's cool. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Oh, we have diff different levels of automation within the factory. So we have the pure manual machines. We talked about some of the semi-automated ones. That's where you program certain features in. Those are uh, repeatable. And as you kind of scale up in higher and higher volume production, you actually want to change the style of manufacturing you're doing. So these uh, machines are all CNC controlled, computer numeric controlled. Um, so they're all programmed, they're highly repeatable. We have very specific fixtures, very specific tools. Cool. And then as we go to the production side of the shop, I'll get into the details of what we do differently there to enable another level of scale. So we're going to peruse through here and we're going to kind of cut a nice uh, tour path that might interrupt some of our machinists a little bit, but I think it'll give you some good, good visuals of what we do in the factory. Sure. So Steve is working on a part here in this machine. Steve, what are you working on? Uh, this is this little uh, Lox vein housing. So. so we got a lot of first stage engine parts uh, going through the machine shop right now. We got Dave working on one, Steve working on another. This is one of our uh, more challenging five access parts. So. Thanks, Steve. We're going to carry on. It's a good looking part. Ah, uh, yes it is. What's ah. up, Daniel? What's up, Bryce? Daniel's working on, what are you working on here, Daniel? Uh, these are uh, brackets. Uh, these are for the thrusters. It's like the, um, basically the gas tank for the thruster. Uh, this radius is what kind of locks it in. So how many of these are you making? Uh, 30. Cool. Yeah, they asked for 30. I might give them 32. But nice. I'll screw two up. <laughs> so Daniel's working on some Astro Space Engine parts here. And this is an example of maybe one of the higher batch quantities that we've got that goes through the development side of the shop. So we're making 30 of this part. Um, right around 30 is kind of the maximum that we would be running in this side of the shop. Once we start passing about 30, we want to go to maybe one of the machines that we'll talk to in a few minutes. It's so cool to just see it move around on the different axes. Yeah, axis. yeah. This yeah. This part is uh, is yeah running on five different axes right now. Saves saves a lot of time versus the three axis machine. You know, uh, the three axis machine. These would all these would all be different operations. See how the part here. Uh, the part the part has like tapped holes like all over. So if it was a three axis part, you know, here's one operation from the top. Here's another operation. Here's another. Here's another. And here's another. So that would have been five different operations we were able to do in one. Nice. Yeah. Um, fewer operations, the better. It means fewer tools. It means less setup time. Overall, it yeah. means we get parts faster. Very it cool. also just helps you hold really tight tolerances too. Yeah. You, you don't have to reaffix it and get the the, yeah. the fixture just right every time. I mean, even say if you're trying to hit this operation, you can just figure out how to hold it to make sure that the top is, is super flat and dial in in the X and the Y because you don't have any flat edges. 
it, you know, it ends up saving a lot of time if you're able to do it for five axis. Very cool. Cool. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, awesome. All right. Thanks. Let's carry on. Ah, I see there's some of the 30. Yes, uh, that is the rack of those. There, are, uh, Most of them are through op one. I think he's got, I see four uh, billets left uh, that haven't gone through op one yet. Very cool. So as we'll walk down this uh, aisle, we'll go a little faster. Uh, we're getting to lunchtime here, so folks are starting to peel away from the shop. No worries. Uh, but you see, uh, you know, we, we run some of these machines when they're doing simple operations. You can basically run even some of these unattended. That's so cool to see. I'm, I imagine it gets boring after a while to see the machine run, but I'm like a kid in a candy store right now. Just like, oh look, it's, it's milling. Yeah, the machine shop's pretty sweet. It's like the most, it's almost like an art form, right? You're taking like a brick of raw metal and you're turning it into an actual usable part with real shape. So it is, yeah, the machine shop never gets old. It's very, Good. very amazing capability to have for a lot of reasons on top of the fact that it's just cool. Yeah. Nice. So let's keep going. Uh, we're walking past some lathes now. We, we kind of started, we looked at a couple of the mills that are in the shop, a lot of, mach a lot of machines that we have here. Um, but as we transition over here, uh, we're now entering uh, the chip hallway. And the okay. chip hallway divides the development shop from the production shop. So yeah, we even think about how we're gonna get rid of these many, many, many pounds, many thousands of pounds of chips that we make on these machines. Do they get recycled? They do get recycled, yep. Yeah. So all of our uh, chip hoppers are basically not all of them. Most of the chip hoppers are aligned with this hallway. And then those chip hoppers travel all the way down to a roll-up door at the end of the hall where they get dumped into a large chip hopper or a number of chip hoppers and they get recycled as specific materials. Nice. Cool. Let's head down the hallway here. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the production shop right now. Okay. Um, as you're, uh, we're walking down here, you see a few different types of machines. These are three machines concentrated. These are uh, wire EDMs, electron discharge machines. These allow us to do extremely tight uh, tolerance cuts and hole drilling. Um, we use these for very specific features on both the spacecraft engine and the rocket. Uh, we won't talk at, at great length about these ones, um, but we do have this capability now, and it's a recent capability as we've expanded the shop. Very cool. Yeah. Let's keep going over here. So uh, on this end of the shop, uh, this is the far end of the production shop. What you're looking at are a couple of lathes um, that do have live tooling, um, and they are bar feed lathes. So uh, these lathes are pretty cool in that uh, you can automatically kind of keep a bar loading itself as it makes a part, and it parts it off, and it drops it into one of those little buckets, uh, so and like it'll, it'll just keep making parts. It'll, it'll just keep, once, it, once it's made a part out of the bar, it'll separate it from the bar, then feed more bar in, and then make more parts. Exactly. And even when that bar is done, it'll grab the next bar and then start feeding the next bar. I feel stupid, but it's like, it's like a hot glue gun. When you need more hot glue, you just put the next stick in. Yes, this is a very fancy hot glue gun. Yeah, I think uh, the machinist might be a little offended by that. Yeah, I, I hope I didn't say that too loud. <laughs> so um, Nick and Matt here are, are running the machine. Uh, Nick, what do we got going on right now? Uh, so right now we are cutting uh, turbo pump components for our first stage engine. Um, what makes this machine really cool is that it combines both turning and milling capability in a single uh, package uh, and adds an automation element. Um, so while our development side of the shop is more focused on uh, rapid turnaround, the production side is more focused on like efficient use of resources. Um, this machine, uh, for example, has uh, a bar feeder uh, down on that end, uh, a parts catcher, and a milling capability. So really what that gets us the ability to run the machine further into the night unattended. Nice. Cool. Thanks, Matt. All right, so Nick mentioned uh, what sort of capability we get out of these machines. Uh, they're called lights out machines, uh, typically. It means that we can basically program a part or program a job yep. into the machine, program exactly what material we're going to use, what tooling we're going to use, and then the machine can run unattended. Nice. So, so you're, when you're leaving for the night, you give it a whole bunch of bar stock, you tell it what to do, you come back in the morning, you have a whole bunch of parts. You have a hopper full of parts. Love it. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love that. We got a lot more of these machines in the production shop. That's kind of what the production shop is all about. We actually organize the shop differently. I mentioned before we have a machinist that takes a job from beginning to end. Yep. Uh, in the production shop, we have several different roles. So we have a programming role, kind of a setup role, or operator role. And so um, that really enables us to uh, ultimately prep for where we, when we might run, run multiple shifts. Um, but also it divides the roles up so we can keep these machines fed. Nice. They want to be fed, 
right? They have a lot of capability and we want to keep them uh, moving. Yeah, and I, I imagine there are at least some of these, if not all of them, are significant investments. So the more time they're working, the better. Exactly. So uh, right now we're in front of a five axis pallet loading machine. So um, as you heard earlier from Daniel, uh, he was making some five axis parts. It's very handy, particularly when you're making engine parts, which have like maybe complex servo machinery or complex geometries, um, to be able to use five axes. And so a lot of our engine parts will go through this machine, which is a lights out version of a five axis. Wow, okay. So there's a place where you feed in bar stock and it just does its thing? Yeah, this will see, receive billets. So maybe you take the bars and you chop those up. Um, so those will become bricks and you'll feed those into this machine. So it'll start from a slightly different thing. From It won't start from bars, but it'll start from, um, you know, maybe usually rectangular brick. Yeah, but basically you have a way to input a whole bunch of raw material and when it's used the raw material, it moves on to the next piece. Yeah, exactly. And we'll show you another machine that'll make it super clear how that all works. Oh, cool. Very cool uh, in just a sec. Actually, let's walk over to it now. All right. <laughs> so over here, we've got a horizontal mill. Um, this has a similar operating system where it has um, pallets that you load up. And we'll show you what those load on those stations look like, but uh, I wanted to point this area out because you can kind of get a good idea of what some of the pallets look like. Um, so each one of these pallets has kind of a vertical set of fixturing on it. Uh, we call those tombstones. They have lots of different options for how you would fixture. You can make big parts on them. You can make lots of small parts on them. Um, and those would hold raw materials or uh, in-process jobs as they're running. You can actually see uh, the, the pallet changer is operating. It's moving around. It's grabbing different pallets right now. Um, and it's moving them from station to station. You can see it's placing a tombstone. I believe it's placing a tombstone. I can't really see from my angle. Yeah. Uh, placing a tombstone into um, a transfer station, which is a 180 degree kind of rotation. So we're loading up a next job right now while it's running a job in the machine. So let's walk around this way and I'll show you what the operator side, we're kind of on the back side of the machine right now. And as you walk along the back side, you can also see we have a number of different tools um, wow. because, again, because we're vertically integrated, we actually um, can kind of control what sort of features we put in our parts. Yeah. And so we have common radii, uh, common tapped hole geometry, uh, common drill depths. And so we actually stock uh, standard tools in most of our machines to be able to hit the same sort of features. So it's really easy for us to take a job from one machine and then uh, re-hit the same sort of tolerances and shapes on another. Makes sense. And we have about 100 tools that we use as kind of standardized tools. And so this machine has uh, more than twice that, I think it's about three times that many tools. So we, we can do a lot of custom tooling on this machine. And this is a lights out sort of machine. This is a, the, the biggest workhorse we have in the factory. So we do expect uh, the most tooling to be in the tool changer here. I'm noticing a trend where a lot of these machines are lights out machines. Yeah, we're in the production shop. Yeah, exactly. I like it. So let's keep going and I'll show you the, uh, the business side of this. Oh, we caught this at a good time. Oh, that is neat. So you see his tombstone being loaded into the load on load station. So this is a little different from the CNC machines you saw in the development shop. Uh, we interact with them in a different way. So typically uh, we have a, a set up an operator folks that'll be interacting with these two areas here. Um, so essentially we'll load raw materials or uh, work in process parts onto a tombstone with uh, custom fixturing for those jobs. And then we will tell the computer what fixtures and what raw material is loaded and what jobs we need to produce. So uh, those will then go into the pallet rack where they'll be stored into our job queue, uh, which is essentially how we can run throughout the night. Uh, so that job queue will be fed into the machine here and um, will essentially run apart just like a regular CNC machine, but there's a whole bunch of automation around feeding that machine. Okay, so the, you say the tombstone. Yeah. Is that the, the black vertical part or is that it is, the, the metal part that it's on? That's that is the, the, the black vertical part. Uh, so the pallet is kind of the base. The tombstone is a, a style of fixturing that we Got use it. here. And it allows us, we essentially have four sides available to us to run the tombstone fixtures so we can index them. And we can actually make lots of, you see Sean actually rotating it yep. around. Yep. A good example of how, uh, how we use the tombstones here. So we can make lots of parts. Um, with four axes on this machine. It's a horizontal mill, typically four axes. So you don't even necessarily need to be making a whole bunch of the same part. You could just put something on this side of the tombstone, something on that side of the tombstone, and then the machine just knows, on this side, I'm going to do this and this. On this side, I'm going to make something completely different. That is exactly correct. Very cool, saves time. It does, and we have uh, standard uh, ways of attaching our fixtures to all of the tombstones. So it's very easy for us to very repeatedly change those out with very little setup time. 
Question. Yeah. Why, what's with the green light? Uh, so all the lights mean different things. Uh, a green light essentially means it's, it's good to go, it's operating. Um, each light uh, color means something different. A blue light, for example, means that there's no activity. Um, like it's safe. Yeah, it's in kind of manual mode. Um, and it's not in automated mode. So if you walk up to these and they're red, you know it's like- There's a problem. The computer's mad. Yeah. So if you get a red light in any of these stations, there's, there's actively a problem. You'll see on many of the machines, there'll be colored lights. Um, an and on light is what that's typically called. Yeah. Um, and you, it indicates status of some of the machines. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, one more thing I want to point out. So this is basically a big cell, right? And we have a lot of custom tooling on here. And sometimes uh, we don't want to run the horizontal mill to make our tools. So we have a regular three axis CNC machine right next to the machine. We make tools for this machine <laughs> right next to it. You have a big machine. machine that makes the tools for the bigger machine. Yes, I exactly. love it. Exactly. Can, um, can I look in this window right here? Yeah, I, see, yeah, I saw something spinning. Hey, Sean, you want to talk to us about what's going on in here? So we just switched out pallets right now, and then we're starting a new program. So what's nice about this machine is it'll automatically load a pallet in the back while parts running inside here. And as soon as that's done, those pilots will switch out for the least amount of downtime as possible. Uh, so right now we're just running spindle, uh, warm up, with some cooling going on. And as soon as that program is done, we'll switch out to the next pallet and the next one. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, cool. No problem. Thanks, Sean. Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to head this way. What's up, Dan? So this is our maintenance hub. This is where we uh, command and control maintenance for the entire factory. So we just saw Dan over there. Uh, Dan actually uh, maintains most of the equipment here. Uh, this station right here is our finishing station. So this is where we might install things like threaded inserts or do little finishing work to some of our machine parts. Makes sense. Before they come into the QC lab. You'll notice that this is in the production side of the shop. So this is a recent thing that we've added into Astra as we've been able to invest in a facility and our ability to go uh, produce things at scale. It's very important that we have parts that are going to work when they're on the production floor so we don't actually stop production. Yeah. And the QC lab is how we ensure that those yeah, parts. Yeah, just like you guys said in Space Tech Day, reliability and scale. Reliability and scale, you got it. Wow. So maybe I can grab Melissa. Melissa, you want to describe to us what's going on in here? Um, hello. Hi. Uh, this is the uh, quality control lab. Uh, we inspect all of um, our machine parts from our internal machine shop. And we also do uh, supplier validation for purchased product as well. Makes sense. Um, so we sort of have like a two-way stream going on here. Um, sometimes we'll get something from a supplier that will come through our lab that we check, and then we do some post-machining on it. So for example, we have these um, castings here that we'll inspect from the casting supplier, and then they'll get a secondary option op operation on the machine. Nice. What sorts of equipment do you use? Huh? What sorts of oh, equipment do you we use? Have all yeah. kinds of fun stuff. We have a, a ton of hand tooling. Um, we particularly use that for uh, sort of uh, in process inspection for the machine shop. So each operation, we validate the machinist's programs. Um, and then uh, we also have a sort of our, uh, our shining star here. Um, yeah, what is this guy? Or what, what do you even call this? It's a direct computer controlled coordinate measuring machine. Neat. Uh, we say DCC CMM and frequently just DCC because it's a lot of letters. Um, this one in particular uh, is pretty special because frequently uh, the probes on the end, which is where most of the the business happens yeah. are three axis. So this fun spinny movement that is doing, most CMMs don't do. Um, and this allows us to do get two things. One, it's incredibly accurate. Makes um, sense. It actually gives us more data than we actually need for certain things. So we, we actually have to like whittle things down a little bit. Um, and it's also, uh, in addition to that, incredibly fast. So right now, the machine isn't even running at 100% speed. It's only running at about 25%. Um, Work harder, machine. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, so we use it for uh, two sorts of things. Um, so we have um, our uh, spacecraft engine 
uh, product. Yep. We use this to do um, acceptance inspection mostly, but for uh, Rocket 4 on System 2.0, uh, we actually work really closely with engineering and the machine shop um, to uh, provide data back to engineering and to machine shop so that we can uh, have like a tighter uh, loop on like the uh, design and development process. And just, right? You can just iterate faster that way. Mm -hmm. Neat. And we can do, um, so like this for example is um, a camshaft for our first stage engine flight termination system. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, it has like, it actually has some pretty, pretty tight and pretty complex geometry. Um, we're able to import the uh, 3D model that the engineer has designed and the machine shop has machined yeah. with um, into the software and do an inspection and compare it directly to the CAD. And so if it's off, the machine says, hey, this isn't what you thought it was going to be. Or if it's just right, yeah. it says, hey, it's just right. Yeah, and even, and you know, for the design and development loop, right, like sometimes it makes it so that we know that as we're going through testing, um, engineering has that data if something lo is looking kind of weird or say something looks really great, we can either uh, tighten tolerances on things to like really work in and get something smaller, but sometimes it also means that we can open them up, right? Which like makes it much easier for us to manufacture things yeah. uh, much more quickly. Makes sense. So it's beeping right now. Is it mad at me? Did I, did I offend um, it? No, it's, it's beeping because it's actually taking individual points right now. Um, it's also capable of, um, so one of the other sort of special things about it. Oh, it's gonna switch tools. It's gonna switch tools. Um, is, uh, so typically these uh, probes use uh, kinematics to take points. So it's actually, a, it takes pressure and does displacement. It's like a cosine error. This one actually has, a, um, a laser. Um, the the stylus here, this carbon fiber shaft is actually hollow. And, and there's so a laser in it? Laser, there's a laser that wow. to the end of it and then back. And that's how it takes the points. That's cool. And so it's actually able to, um, I mean, it can take tens of thousands of points in a matter of seconds. Uh, so, Neat. That's why I have the. I need my space. It's no. It's it's it, out of the way. it needs its space. <laughs> I'm fortunately short enough I can get under here just fine. Uh, but yeah, very cool. Is, yeah, it's it's my favorite. Yeah, you do all kinds of stuff in here too. Uh, what's what's going on over here? Is this like a microscope? It is. Uh, it is a microscope, uh, but it's also capable of doing um, dimensional inspection. So we use this for some of our um, uh, non-contact things that we need to get in to, to inspect. So um, this is a bore that gets a, this is one of our uh, manifolds for our spacecraft engine. And um, the bore on this um, is very sensitive to scratches and things, so we don't want to touch it. Um, so this allows us to uh, take non-contact measurements um, on this particular feature. Neat. Um, so yeah. Cool. Thanks, Melissa. I think we're going to get back out the door into the main hallway and yeah. appreciate you showing us around. Yeah, thanks so much. Cool. Oh, really quick, who drew the unicorn? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> well, it's great. <laughs> so are you seeing a trend here? Lots of automation. And I love the term lights out machines. Having the quality control lab right in the shop is a smart and logical thing to do, and it helps Astra iterate and ensure quality and reliable parts. Now, let's take a look at the star of the show, the rocket assembly line, and talk to CEO Chris Kemp. So we're back in the main aisleway. Uh, this is where raw materials come in. So among those raw materials, actually a coil of aluminum comes in that door and goes all the way to this line. So we're gonna get into a little bit more of the factory, and I think I see uh, Chris is actually walking up here. Oh, a wild CEO has appeared. <laughs> <laughs> hey Chris. Hey, hey Chris. Hey. Nice to nice to see you guys. So Chris, what do you think of the factory here? 
Awesome. Um, you guys have reached my favorite part. Uh, this is our new rocket production line. So we just covered that the coil comes through the door and we Sweet. haven't talked about the machine. Yeah, so basically a coil of aluminum gets inserted in one side of this machine and uh, we make rocket stages out the other side of the building. So we can turn one coil into about three rockets and the coils cost $25,000 or so. Yep, about that. So we're really working on applying automotive manufacturing to rockets. Nice. Line. So this is the new rocket production line for Rocket 4. It's cool that it just goes from coil to rocket all in one device. Yep, okay, it's got different stages, but we can want to walk them in. Yeah, why stages. don't we just show it off? Cool. So the first thing first thing you see here is the coiler. So that 5,000 pound coil gets loaded onto this um, loader here, yep. brings it into the machine, uh, and then it actually gets fed. This machine is largely automated, so uh, each major piece of equipment on this line is automated and some of the transfers are manual. Eventually we can always automate those transfers and then increase our production rates. Makes sense. Um, but what you see is the, the coiler gets decoiled and feeds into this straightener. So it comes with a kind of a curvature as it comes out of the coil. Uh, we flatten it with a number of pinch rollers and then we take it into a detensioning loop. So this allows us to deal with a little bit of non-straightness. Uh, if there's a little bit of non-straightness coming out of the coil, they're not always perfectly trimmed. Um, and it also allows us to decouple the mechanical motion of the two machines. That makes sense. So it allows us the flexibility to have, a, you know, uh, control mechanisms that uh, don't have to be timed to the nanosecond. Chris, you said this is your favorite part of the factory. Yeah. Do you have a favorite part of your favorite part of the factory? <laughs> like, I imagine it's when the, the finished piece comes out the end. It is. Well, in a lot of ways, this whole machine uh, was designed alongside Rock 4. And every single aspect of this, such as the width of the coil, uh, the ability to kind of cut and clean up uh, the uh, sheets of aluminum has been designed with intention. So imagine not having this, you'd have to have all of these pieces come in on pallets, uh, there's shipping costs, they get damaged, uh, you can't make adjustments. So this gives not only the team an opportunity to design and iterate more quickly during development, but also it dramatically reduces the cost of the finished product when we're in production. Makes sense. Yep. I mean, you don't just build the rocket, you build the machine that builds the rocket and everything efficiency-wise follows from that. Yeah, I mean, this is a true rocket production line and it's designed in, in the very spirit that an automotive production line is designed where you have raw material from the one side and you have you know, the primary structure of the vehicle from the other side. Nice. You'll, you'll see the whole thing. <laughs> Did I hear you right on Space Tech Day that this is supposed to make a rocket a day or can make up to a rocket a day? That's right. It was designed to produce a rocket a day out of this facility and some of these uh, stages can actually produce even more material than that for development currently, and then in, in some stages we would add another module, uh, and of course you add more labor to accomplish the higher production rate, and uh, all of these machines are designed to reduce the total labor content of the vehicle, so that's really what drives costs. Nice. I like driving costs because that means cheaper access to space. Indeed. Yeah. That's exactly what it means. <laughs> Um, so it's, yeah, when Chris says a rocket a day, uh, th these pieces of equipment are specifically designed around a rocket a day in one shift as our wow. total capacity. <laughs> That's yes. so cool. So we're not, we're not yes. making this stuff up. Um, it was, you know, it's really marginally uh, more expensive to go from a rocket a week to a rocket a day if you're designing the vehicle and the factory and the line. And so we decided, you know, this is one area that we want to invest in the factory, that we want to go all the way to rocket a day um, and just do it once. And so we've basically, you know, sized up the diameter of the rocket, we've sized up the equipment on the line, and everything was all designed in concert so that as we um, go on to, you know, scale up and potentially have future versions of the rocket, we already have the equipment in place and we don't have to redo this work. It makes sense. And if you think about the, the utility of this, a rocket a day is not really a crazy amount of capacity. And when you think about all the small satellites that all want to placed in particular orbits on particular schedules and all these mega constellations where you can replace failed satellites, you can do gap filling, you can uh, do better capacity management. Uh, this really fills in a gap, much like small airplanes uh, fill in a gap where large cargo planes operate kind of the, the bulk. In yeah. The, in the I want a non-stop. I don't want to have to go to a hub and then go to my stop. Yeah. And then you're, you guys are making the non-stop yeah. versus the large, you know, hub bound uh, yeah, bigger. It's, it's very much like a bus. You know, you can take the bus, but the bus is going to leave at the wrong time and it's going to drop you off at the wrong place. <laughs> you're going to have to spend some time getting ready yes. to go. That's Money. Right. So the, but it's all about economics, right? If the Uber is only a little bit more expensive than the bus, you'll take the Uber. Uh, but if it's a lot more expensive, you'll just wait for the bus. Yeah. And so we're really trying to drive the economics to the point where uh, choosing a dedicated launch uh, is always the right choice for the majority of payloads. Very cool. What do you guys say? Daily space delivery? 
Uh, that, I believe, was our Wi-Fi password on the first day of the company. So <laughs> we set out with this, wow. this, with this goal. Yep. Very cool. Towards, towards it ever since. I mean, it's clear. The, the progress, the difference in the factory since the last time we and were you here. We were here, and then we, you came back, and this was here. This is amazing. I mean, this was all like cubicles last time, and now it's a, a rocket building machine. So it talks about the detensioning loop, uh, what that is for. Um, so we come into the main laser bed. So uh, this is sized so that we can make a continuous cut on a laser cutter. It's called blanking is the term that's used in automotive. Uh, so we do laser blanking here. And the reason this machine is the size that it is is because we can do one continuous rectangular, mostly rectangular cut uh, that will bring a barrel together at rocket force diameter with only a single friction stir weld seam. Oh, that's satisfying. Yes, very satisfying. So it really reduces the amount of uh, times you need to be on a machine, which is part of the way that we get to uh, overall time of a, a rocket a day. I gotta say too, I love the aesthetic. Like, it's, it's an Astra looking machine. It's a very <laughs> Astra looking machine, yeah. We designed it as a custom machine. Yes, yeah. yes. So it took several years. In fact, it arguably took longer to build this production line um, than it did to develop the first uh, iteration of the rocket. Yeah, because yeah, you guys, I remember even on our last factory tour and when we did our interviews with you guys, like, this is something you've been working towards for a long, long, long time. Very long. It must be very satisfying to see it come to fruition. Yeah. It's incredibly satisfying. <laughs> this, Chris and I have been talking about this for, for six years. Since day one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're either all in or you're not. You're either going to do something that makes the rocket really expensive, and then it's going to be really expensive compared to the Starship and some other rockets that are coming online, or you're going to go all in and you're going you're to invest in the scale, and you're going to invest in all of the reliability and the, the vertical integration that we've invested in, and uh, it's a big bet. It's yeah. worthwhile though, because, you know, like you guys say, improving life from space. I, I really, really appreciate that mantra, improve life from space. Because so often, when people maybe aren't space fans, or rocket nerds, or what have you, or maybe they're just, they just don't know better, they're like, why are we going to space? And it's like, you guys say it, right on the box. Yep. We're going to improve life on Earth from space. Yep. I mean, you look at what so many of these, like, killer apps are, you know, Planet, I think, is a killer app. You yeah. take a picture of Earth every day, you know what's going on. Uh, Starlink, killer app, right? The yep. ability to provide global connectivity. And these are all focused on providing uh, people, Earthlings, <laughs> benefits. And, uh, you know, that's not to take anything away from becoming a multi-planetary species, these, these rockets that we're going to need to build to explore the solar system. No, of course not. Uh, this is a, a really unique mission. Uh, it's, a, it's a distinct mission that we really are inspired by here. Yeah, no, it's like we, we can do all the things. We can be multi-planetary, we can help people on, on Earth. We don't have to, it's not about forgetting Earth or leaving Earth, it's about helping Earth. Yep. Yep. Love it, I really love that. Yep. Right, cool, so more machine? Yeah, let's yeah. so let's keep walking this thing, it's rather large. <laughs> um, I see Nate's hanging out over here. Maybe Nate, maybe Nate, you want to talk us through what happens after we laser cut? Sure, uh, this is our new laser cutter. Uh, this machine will produce the large format blakes we need for our uh, first stage and upper stage tanks. Uh, after the pattern is cut, uh, some smaller scrap will uh, fall away and exit here. Then the material will transition out onto this layer. Now here we'll remove larger scrap as needed uh, before the material then moves towards the four bar uh, af After the material transitions from the outfeed conveyor, in this area, we clamp the material to square it with respect to the four bar roller. Okay. Uh, here we roll it into the shape we need. Uh, this machine was designed to roll the correct radius right up until the very edge. Wow. So it comes out of the laser blanker, it heads over here, you square it, and then you roll it. Yep. Very cool. And then onto the friction stir welder where we weld these linear seams together. And you only need one seam. That's right. Love it. Nice and simple. Yep. Cool. Well, thanks, Nate. Yeah, no problem. Cool, yeah. So Nate mentioned we use a four bar roller here so we can roll all the way to the ends of the barrel so we have a nice, perfect cylinder. A typical th roller uses three bars. Are th um, those the, the, the bars we're seeing on the bottom there? Yeah, so you have uh, two pinching and then two that uh, you use to form. And so because we have a four bar roller, it means that we go, you can see the radius of that barrel is all the way to the very edge of the barrel, so yep. we don't have a flat section. And uh, when we go to weld the tank up, we actually offset our friction stir welds. And so it means we have a nice cylindrical uh, circular uh, pattern that we can weld easily uh, with simple fixturing on the next machine. Love it. So you don't have to like cut off a flat strip on the end. It's, it's all about optimizing the time that things spend in each station and 
going faster through the process so that you can get to that rock of the day. Exactly. And so it takes uh, a little less than 10, mi 10 minutes to actually run through a, a roll on this machine. Wow, 10 minutes? Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's all automated. Each, it each part of this is automated. In Rocket 3, we had to do this in various stages, and the material would come on pallets, uh, yep. one cylinder at a time, yep. and a lot of times it would be damaged in shipping, and uh, then of course you've got a huge amount of uh, floor space being taken up by all of this, all this inventory of, of giant uh, aluminum cylinders. Yeah. And so on many dimensions, it's, it's uh, a lot better just to kind of turn a coil of aluminum into exactly the material that you need, and then you're not sitting on a lot of inventory, uh, especially if you have things that change perhaps, then you have scrap issues. So it's like, it's like just-in-time production, yeah. not even just-in-time. Uh, so this line follows a lot of lean principles. Love right? it. We've got single-piece flow, essentially going from workstation to workstation, really, really minimizing work in progress, whip. Um, we can do just-in-time sort of, which barrel do you need? It gets blanked, and then you know, 30 minutes later, it's a barrel um, from the start of a, a wow. laser cut. Yeah. Um, so That's crazy. We can, it's a pull-type system, kind of like a, like a Toyota production system. Those are some of the lessons that Toyota has taught the world. Uh, we use a lot of those lessons here on this line. I love it. Yeah. Cool. So what's next? Yeah. So next is the friction sir welder. So we take the barrel, uh, we unload it onto these rollers, then we pick it and we drop it into these rollers. This is Rocket Force friction sir welder. We actually did a little video on this, uh, a little bit of a deep dive here. And so if you want to check that out, maybe we can like, I don't know, maybe we can post it in the link or something. Yeah. Uh, that'd be great. So people can do the, the deep dive into the machine. Yeah, for sure. So this machine is unique, um, really, because what it does is um, it characterizes the weld performance as it's running. So uh, it's equipped with a lot of different sensors, you know, force feedback, position feedback, speeds, feeds, um, light curtains, all sorts of things uh, that our automation engineering team has, has come up with. So it's kind of like it's condensing the manufacturing of the part and the quality control of the part into, exactly. into one machine. So it's measuring everything. So we've actually quantified what a failed weld looks like as well. And we put boundaries on actually the weld performance as it's running. And so Owen and the team have actually developed uh, a little bit of code um, yeah. that maybe you could tell us about it instead of me. Yeah, yeah so there, there's a couple different layers to it. So one is actually running on the machine in real time. And what that's doing is it's looking at where in the weld we are and looking at each of the parameters that are collected and setting basically uh, bounds on them. So for, here we go. <laughs> for any reason it goes above or below uh, some of our critical parameters, the operator immediately gets a warning saying, weld fail. If at the end of the weld, we stayed within our boundaries that we've proven to be a good weld, get weld passed. So it's very simple. But then uh, after the weld is completed, there's some code that runs that then goes to take a look, make some plots so that we can kind of take that data correlated to some of the, uh, the physical testing that we have done and will do on end of the barrel to continuously build up our data set. So we're constantly getting better and better data. Right now, this is really quiet because I actually have it off the work piece. Okay. It's currently not doing I was work. I was about to ask, <laughs> is it friction stir welding right now? Because it is currently not friction stir welding. It, it's backed off the work piece. And the reason for that is uh, I want to make sure that everything is perfectly aligned. So this machine controls the position as well as the force, the RPM, and everything to very, very small tolerances. And so anytime uh, any change is made, I just like to verify that we're, we're still running, right? Uh, in Rocket 3, because we didn't have any of the automation, uh, we had to test every weld. So when the barrels would come off, we had to have a coupon. We had to pull the edge of the barrel wow. and make sure that the weld performed well enough uh, to meet our requirements. Uh, and all the data is, is going back into a giant data lake as well. Uh, so we can attach all the data for every serial number of the rocket. Um, so if there's something that occurs later in the, in the integration process, we can go back and look at the data that came off the machine. Nice. Our and data lake and our data collection system is a whole a big, whole massive video, piece actually, of Astra, and we should yeah. definitely do There's a, a video separate. on that. Yeah, I, I am, I'm really interested, honestly, because the, the larger a family of data, the bigger the pool that you have, yeah. the more you're able to you know, quantify things. I mean, I always say it on streams, more data, more better. Yeah. So, yeah. I like it. so it, every single bit of data from every sensor on every test that's ever been conducted on any piece of hardware can be read by any engineer at Astra at any time, and it's all in one giant data lake. Wow. So it's an incredibly powerful platform. We've invested a lot there. Yeah, I mean, it shows. There's yeah. just layer after layer after layer of investment here in scaling things up, making things more reliable, and getting it so that you can produce rockets rapidly and cheaply. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> Affordably. Yeah.
<laughs> affordably. Thank you. I, I, I should use better words. Affordably. Cool. Thanks, Owen. Right. Thanks, Owen. Next stage. So yeah, one of my, uh, my fun fact, my favorite thing that I like to tell folks, uh, we're in a hallway right now, and this is actually designed around being one continuous yeah. line. It's about 200 feet long. Uh, the line is so long that we had to put a hallway in the middle of it. Uh, we debated at length a year or so ago where we were going to put the hallway so that our employees could walk from their desks, which are generally over there, to the kitchen. Uh, very important that we have a path between those two places. Yes. So we had to divide the factory up with a hallway in the middle of it because this line is so long. So this is this is the Astra Snack Hallway, if we're going to name it. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So you see the green stripes. This is, this is uh, you do not need safety equipment here other than uh, the areas where we stripe them off. Um, cool. And when we do a transfer across the line, we bring up um, safety barriers and then we will uh, bring parts across uh, from one station to, to the next. Nice. Yeah. All right, what's next? So the oh, Cirque TIG. Holy cow. Yeah. Wow. So this is uh, version two of our circumferential TIG welder. Um, you know, we've, there are a couple of parts of the process of the line that we, we haven't covered, we won't cover today. Um, but essentially, the Cirque TIG receives barrels from the friction stir welder over there and uh, barrels with domes already in them from another station. Um, and it goes ahead and attaches those uh, barrels uh, with or without domes uh, to effectively grow a tank. So you see a first stage um, in the process of being manufactured right now. You can actually kind of see one of our domes uh, that looks like the forward LOX dome, so forward end, aft end. Um, I believe is there a common dome in there or is it? Is a common dome in here, yes. So we use a different style of dome manufacturing for Rocket 4. Um, I'll maybe get you to a sample there in a sec so we can do, do a little quick dive into the cool. dome manufacturing method. Um, but yeah, really simple machine. Um, it, it incorporates a lot of lessons that we learned during Rocket 3's production on a similar style of machine. You know, a lot about how we fixture our weld torch and our wire feed um, and how we have operator inputs that um, are active you know, during the weld, uh, potentially for e-stops or anything like that, um, and then also how we tune in our development weld. So uh, a lot of lessons learned. We essentially took a very, very similar style of machine, adapted it to Rocket 4's diameter, um, you know, gave ourselves a local gantry crane dedicated to transferring. So a lot of, a lot of really good lessons that we learned. It's kind of that, that like iterative flavor of why we've invested in these different rockets over the years. It's to learn lessons like this so that by the time we actually want to produce the one that scales, we've already learned a lot of those lessons. Yeah. And we don't have to learn them while we're also uh, trying to get straight into a ramp from zero. Yeah, I like it. One of the things about this rocket is at this diameter, you're approaching the limit of what you can put in a shipping container. Makes sense. And so one of our value propositions is mobility. So yep. we can take the system, we can deploy it anywhere in the world, and we can conduct a launch with a mobile launch platform, and the rocket can be integrated in a container. So actually, if you think about the limit to the size and the capacity of our vehicle, yeah. it's constrained by, do we want to go beyond what fits in the shipping container, right? Yeah. So if you go beyond what fits in the shipping container, then you've got a lot higher transportation cost and logistics cost and things like that. So uh, this allows us to basically push the limits of the energy in the fuel uh, to, the, to the maximum. So yeah. once we optimize everything on this design and the engines and everything, we can probably push about a ton of capacity. Uh, from this platform. And so this whole production line is designed to support a rocket that has that one ton capacity in, in the end of the life cycle. I love it. And it's it's like you said, you, you're, one of your value propositions is being able to launch from basically any concrete pad that you can get access to and have you know approvals to launch from, etc. Yep. And that's so important for a variety of reasons, including, like you said, it's Space Tech Day, reconstituting you know critical infrastructure in the event that becomes necessary. Yeah, it's about resiliency, not just mobility. So, you know, if Cape Canaveral or Vandenberg, or I guess now Brownsville isn't available, uh, well, what do you do? How do you how do you reconstitute a capability? Yeah, like what if there's a hurricane at the Cape? What if there's an earthquake yeah. at, at Vandenberg or what have you? Like, right. we need to account for that. Yeah, and most of the new satellites are 500 kilograms or more. So we need a rocket that has the capacity to be useful to reconstitute critical capabilities like the SDA's new constellation that they're building. So this, this connects all of that. Very cool. I'm loving this. This how does how does it feel when you when you stand here and you look at a, an entire you know barrel section like this, like a, a grown rocket, as you say. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty freaking cool. Uh, seeing it all come together, seeing the factory come together has been amazing. Uh, really, like we love it when we have a lot of hardware, when we're hardware rich. Um, so it's just a really cool. Uh, it's a really really special feeling to see all of the hard work. There's so many people here that have invested so much time so much effort into all of these processes. They're all qualified production processes. Like we go through very rigorous campaigns of testing. We 
talked about friction stir welding, we do that for all of our kind of manufacturing methods that, yeah. are, that are very important for the, the performance of the vehicle. There's an incredible amount of work that happens to get to this point. And so really it's like just, it's the reward yeah. for all that work. If you look, if you go back in time and you look at the 1.0 vehicle, the 2.0 vehicle, yeah. that, was an, that was a time where we were incredibly scrappy. We didn't have any of this, right? And we really had a very small team that just threw, th threw things together that allowed us to prove out the software and the overall approach of mobility and the overall system. As we got to Rocket 3, it became more mature, but we realized we had to dial it up one more notch um, and have a whole mission assurance organization, a reliability lab, and a lot more automation in the manufacturing process. Nice. So this represents kind of a the third swing at what is the appropriate level of investment in the rigor around the engineering processes and also the qualification of all of the different uh, manufacturing processes that ultimately come together in the in the final launch system. Very cool. Yeah. One more notch. You guys took it to 11. Like it's a, you, <laughs> you don't want to overdo it, <laughs> but yeah. you definitely don't want to underdo it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, Love it. So this is an entire first stage yeah. w with that piece attached. That would be the entire first stage tankage? Uh, that would be it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if we're about to get another barrel. If I, if I had if I'd spent the time to count them, I might be able to tell you off the top of my head. What is being inserted? Yeah, it looks like we're short one barrel. Okay, off got the it. Rough top of my head. Yeah. So cool. And yeah. it's just immediately obvious compared to Rocket 3 how much bigger this thing is. Yeah. I mean, it's, well, and like you said, you're, you built it so it's, the, it's a, the biggest you can fit in a shipping container, which is interesting because a lot of our viewers might know that Falcon 9 was made so that it's the maximum size to be road transportable. Right. So it's interesting, like a similar philosophy, you have the maximum size you can fit in a shipping container at, while still you know, getting the most fuel in, in, a, in a rocket tank, yep. but also being still mobile and still responsive. Yeah, yeah I think Starship is trying to be the biggest rocket possible. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. so, I, so I think that'll drive your cost per kilogram down as much as possible. We're trying to drive the price per launch down. And so you do that by really driving all of the trades around uh, the overall cost of production, automation, automation during launch operations, and also transportation. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. All about unit economics. Yeah. Love it. So I think it's the first time I've ever said I love economics in my life. But I, but I truly do. I love it. Because, yes. again, it's, it's all, all in the service all of, economics. of making access to space yeah. more available. Yeah. So. Yeah, we, if we want to do this for a really long time, which we do, it means we need we must make a very, very sustainable business out of it. Yeah. So what will this be used for? Is this like a structural test thing, or what are we what are we looking at here when it's built and assembled? Or is it more of like a to qual the machine that's building it, this is or an actual qual tank? So uh, they're taking this out next week to our other test facility. They're going to fill it up with liquid nitrogen and water, and they're going to do a whole bunch of. Uh, pressure tests, so yeah. we're, we're going to basically cycle the tank a lot with cryo, and then we're going to probably burst it. Well, we love test tanks here. We call our, uh, our viewers tank watchers for a reason, Yeah. because we spend a lot of time looking at test tanks and waiting for them to burst or what have you. Like, you have to make sure the big steel balloon can hold pressure, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah you, want that, you want that thing to be as light as possible, and you want it to do the job all the way, though. Yeah, makes sense. Why don't we keep going a little yeah, bit? Um, so, um, what we're looking at here, is a formed dome. So uh, I think we've got, I'm not sure what the destination of this dome is. Uh, there might, there's probably a, a traveler on the other side of this, but um, essentially what you're looking at is our fixture for how we insert domes into barrels. I won't give away all of the secret sauce, um, but we are using a totally different manufacturing method than we did for Rocket 3. Nice. Rocket 3, we started with large forgings and then we machined those down to very thin material. Um, you probably saw in the, some of you, the folks that are watching, uh, might have seen in uh, the last video where we talked about how we took a very heavy uh, forging and made it a very light. Yeah, like you take an entire brick or billet, whatever, you, is yeah. billet the right term? Yeah, that's a, it was a forging in this case. It started in this forging. billet and then was forged into a, a profile. And then you machine all the extra you off. Machine 99% of what we paid for, which is, again, like we talked about in the beginning, deeply offensive. It's offensive to you. Yes. But that's, that in the, in the previous video is the, is the dome that you lifted with your pinky. Yes. Uh, this is on a fixture, so I don't think you can lift it with your pinky. It's but. also a little heavier, it's bigger, <laughs> it's a lot bigger. So uh, this dome is actually stamped. So uh, we talk a lot about how you know Rocket 4 is uh, designed around manufacturing methods. Yep. The diameter was also sized by the practical limitation of what shape we could stamp based on the sheets we can get that get formed into the dome. Nice. So uh, this is a, a one single dome that's stamped out of one sheet. Um, and the production rate of these guys is an order of magnitude, I think it's two orders of magnitude wow. uh, faster than uh, Rocket 3's. So you're not tying up machines in the machine shop to CNC this, 
and you're not throwing away a whole bunch of materials. So there's multiple levels yeah. of improvement. Yeah. In Rocket 3, one of these domes would take several days to machine out yes. of a large, heavy, expensive billet of aluminum that was forged. Uh, we can probably make several hundred of these a day uh, because they're just stamped out like the fender of a car or, the, or a hood of a car. Yeah, to Chris's point, you know, the stamping operations you can, you can do hundreds of times a day. Uh, for overall uh, dome production, our output, I think we can caps out around 20 a day, which is far more than we need. Six of those per rocket. Nice. Yeah. So again, yes. that supports several rockets a day worth of these can be produced. Yeah. yeah. So in five years when we come back and there's two or three of these rocket production lines, you have plenty of domes <laughs> to go with it. Yeah. Hopefully the next time we'll get, we'll get this will be old news, yeah. right? Right. <laughs> Our goal is for this to be old news and you'll see other things we're working on that are clever. I love it. Um, uh, and yeah, again, there's a whole bunch of the factory that we probably won't get a chance to see today. Uh, there are a lot of pieces of hardware that we can't show on video. Um, these are some of the simpler ones, so we've kind of tried to focus on yeah. what we can show. No, we appreciate you guys, you know, showing us everything that you possibly can. I know there's ITAR and there's all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and there's secret sauce too. So, you know, we'd, we at NSF and our viewers definitely really like appreciate the openness and the, the just information because how do you get people excited about space and excited about rockets? You tell them about them. Yeah. So thank you so for that. I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, great to have you guys out. Really quickly. Yes. <laughs> if you need a payload for your first Rocket 4, I have a sticker. So it won't, I don't think it should affect the mass very much, but it's a, it's a Thomas Promise sticker. If you can stick that anywhere on a Rocket 4 that's going to fly, preferably the first one, I think I think we have the, the, the capacity to... Yeah, I, th I think you do. To find so. some space for this, so we'll make it happen. Cool. Right. Well, we'll let you go. Thank you so yeah, much, Chris. Thank you for coming out. Appreciate it. Cool. So before we wrap up, I just want to show you one, I think, kind of cool area that gives you an insight into the way that Astra works. Uh, so we've got our kind of production development area. Yep. And so this... And let me open the section up for you. Um, we've been iterating on the factory layout. So what you just walked through isn't actually the first version of Rocket 4's factory. We actually constructed the factory with a few different you know, big pieces of equipment uh, locked in place. But um, if you were to walk around and take a look at more of the other areas, the subassembly areas, you notice that almost everything is on wheels. Yeah. And when you look at the ground, there's tape on the ground. There's not paint on the ground. Yep. So we also want to make our factory so that it can be dynamic as we iterate the product. We can actually tune the layout of the factory. So what you're seeing here is a pretty clever thing the team came up with, a custom-made magnetic whiteboard uh, that is actually the factory layout. And we've got um, little magnetic strips uh, that you might see, you know, the size of a first-stage tank here, stuck to the whiteboard. Um, so we can, we've gone through several architectures. You see all the different types of aisleways, uh, where you need PPE, where you don't, um, what each area is. We talked about harnessing, avionics subassemblies, the engine subassemblies, clean room, which we didn't go into today, engine final assembly. We went all the way through the shop today and we kind of walked um, up this aisle. Yep. So you saw this portion of the factory yep. up to right here. And so the remaining parts of the factory, there's a lot of work happening in a lot of these different areas. There's development work. So, uh, so this is the snack yeah. aisle. That's very important. That's the snack aisle. Yep, that's the snack aisle. Most important one. aisle. <laughs> okay, but also development is important. Also development is important, yes, yep, yep. <laughs> So we've got you know mission controls. Uh, we've got our thrust structure build. That's a pretty clever thing that maybe we'll get to do another video on. Uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, we've got all the weld booths and stations that are all kind of roped off. Uh, we've got a lot of functional test work here. Hardware in the loop. Um, it's in a little building behind us. Um, it's, fairing assembly. You know, it, it's the whole all the parts of the rocket. They're yeah. all covered here. Well, so like. You have a mocket, which is a you know a mock rocket that you can do testing on all the parts together. This is like a mock factory that you can test a factory out with on a board before you go spend a bunch of time moving stuff around, rearranging things. Dare I say, it's a mactory. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll work. Yeah, yeah. It's an Astra rocket factory simulator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe one of the biggest lessons that we learned as an example of something is that this main big wide aisleway that we actually came down as we walked through and, and talked here, Yeah. Um, that wasn't an original part of this layout. And we learned that as we're moving some of these bigger pieces of Rocket 4, we had kind of given ourselves an aisleway that was wide enough, um, but we had traffic moving in multiple directions, and we have kind of stations that come off the main aisle. We learned actually we want a pretty wide aisle here. 
make sure we can do forklift turnarounds. And so we increased the size of this aisle, we restructured some of the layouts, we changed some of the aisle, we peeled up the tape and we put more tape down. Nice. Um, super quick, easy for us to make changes like that. And we're, we're really proud of the, that style of how we execute, which I, I personally haven't seen anywhere else. Um, and I think it's really cool and, and uh, the team's done a great job. Yeah, no, I really dig the flexibility and the, just the ability to constantly reassess, are we doing this the best way? Yes, okay, continue, or no, let's do it, let's figure out a better way to do it. Yeah. It's like, I think in the, in the last video you said in engineering, if you have a, uh, if you have a very complicated solution to a problem, maybe you're asking, you know, maybe you're solving the wrong problem. Yes. So this seems like a very, you know, it's a whiteboard with a layout of a factory on it. It's very simple, yes. but it's a very good way to solve the problem of how do you lay out the factory. Yeah. Simple scales, right? That's still one of our values, right? Ding! Simplicity. He said it. He said simple scales. Ding! <laughs> this is my favorite. Yeah. Love it. Cool. Um, so I think we'll wrap here. Maybe go get some lunch. Cool. Um, and then if we can afterward, maybe we'll get you over by. Uh, the next thing which we'll we'll probably just show on video oh okay awesome well thank you so much bryson yeah can't wait for that next thing all right i guess i'll just spill the beans here the thing bryson was talking about is a detailed walk around we got to do of rocket four so let's just get right into that yeah this is rocket four uh this is essentially us proving out our production processes um for all the major primary structure pieces of the rocket uh, we've got the engine bay the thrust structure um, we've got the skirt that covers the engines. We've got the tanks um, using all production-like processes, all qualified, um, and a couple of secondary structures as well here. So there are a bunch of learnings that were uh, coming up to this rocket here, and then there are a bunch of learnings that we're going to uh, get from it. So um, we've pro qualified a lot of processes for uh, production as we go into you know, welding or um, machining or anything that has very specific tolerances. Um, to make this thing actually come together when we <laughs> bring the pieces together. Uh, this is us proving that all of those processes, um, as we bring them together, you know, ca from cascading sub-assemblies, um, they actually sum to a rocket that, that mates together correctly. So this rocket is not match drilled or it's not made as a suite of parts that are, you know, specifically only fitted to each other. Um, it's made on a bunch of subassembly tools, so any subassembly should go into any other subassembly so we can produce this rocket more like a car is produced than the way rockets are typically produced. This is us proving that out. That's what this vehicle is for. So we're changing manufacturing methods for the fairing of Rocket 4. Uh, we used to use uh, water jet kind of pedals and a cylindrical section that made um, approximated an ogive uh, contour at the beginning of the fairing. Uh, I don't think we've released exactly how we're making this fairing, uh, for Rocket 4, we might save that for maybe a future video, but um, this fairing is going to be a pure ogive, nice uh, smooth, I mean, you see it, it's a pure ogive, nice smooth contour, um, so it should be a little bit higher aerodynamic performance, um, and we've actually simplified the way that we manufacture this. There was a lot of labor that went into Rocket 3's fairings, we've eliminated the, the uh, large amount of that labor going into Rocket 4. So we'll maybe save that specific technical detail for a future video, which will be cool. Um, but suffice to say, it's different. Um, performance uh, should be a little bit better than Rocket 3's performance from like a mass and structural perspective. Um, and it'll take far fewer hours to manufacture uh, from a personnel standpoint. After the fairing, we've got a few things that are different in Rocket 4 versus Rocket 3. Uh, one, we now have a payload attached fitting, which is kind of a more traditional thing you see on a lot of other rockets. Uh, it's an adapter to adapt the outside of the second stage, we call it the upper stage, um, to the payload uh, itself. So we can now, we have a universal kind of um, interface that we can make several different payload adapters as opposed to mating those directly to the upper stage. Um, I can now, with my arms, uh, show you the length of the upper stage. It's a lot shorter than uh, our last upper stage, which I couldn't bear hug. Um, so uh, I can't bear hug around anymore, but I can do it lengthwise. So we've gone to a common dome architecture for Rocket 4's upper stage, a little different than we did for Rocket 3, where we had two spherical tanks. Uh, we're no longer pressure fed, so we're running at lower pressures, which allows us to use these elliptical domes. Um, and you can see some witness marks for actually uh, where we have welded these domes into this stage. So you have the LOX tank up here, which operates at a bit higher pressure and then you have the common dome and then the kerosene tank at the bottom. 
Uh, so we switched from the pressure fed of Rocket 3 to a pump fed of Rocket 4, going for that higher performance upper stage. Um, and actually the failure that we had on our last Rocket 3 launch was related to the fact that we chose a pressure fed um, upper stage. So this actually eliminates that failure mode um, in addition to having higher performance from the stage itself. Um, yeah, we chose Ursa, really fantastic partner. You can see their engine featured here attached to the upper stage. Um, we have a lot of great friends at Ursa. They're very, very good at designing and building engines. Um, they have a similarly iterative approach to increasing performance over time, which we love. Um, they're you know, all backward compatible with our designs. Um, and they've been really, really great to work with, both you know, technically and from a business partnership. Um, so we love working with Ursa. Um, we're looking forward to having many, many more engines uh, here, basically seeing an inventory uh, ready, to integrate, ready to integrate on the stages. So I mentioned some of the uh, manufacturing processes that we validated by building this. We've also validating, uh, like we will specifically use the tanks um, to go through several test campaigns. And this vehicle, uh, we wanted to do fit checks of a lot of these uh, major components coming together to make sure that in the real world, they actually came together the way we expected. So you can see um, kind of the tolerance stack of uh, where the nozzle skirt lands with respect to the first stage dome. Uh, that's something that's really important as we integrate the stages together. We want to know where that nozzle is going to need some support from the first stage. Uh, so you're looking at the inner stage here. Um, this is an inner stage, which is uh, uh, not completely uh, representative of what will fly. Uh, we'll have a slightly different interface uh, with the upper stage there, um, an actual separable interface and some separation fittings and then some stiffening structure. Um, so but uh, from a skin and manufacturing method of producing the skin, this is essentially what you're looking at for Rocket 4. The first stage uh, tank architecture is essentially the same as the upper stage tank architecture. So we have a common dome tank. Uh, they actually share manufacturing methods for the domes. There are uh, a few different tweaks we make. They have different holes in them that we, we cut, um, but they're stamped using the exact same process. Um, this diameter was chosen essentially around the raw material availability to be able to stamp those domes. So we use that diameter for both upper stage and first stage. Uh, the tanks, uh, you'll have seen this on Rocket 3, very similar heritage to what we learned on those rockets. Uh, friction stir welded uh, longitudinal seams and then uh, TIG weld circumferential seams. Um, the domes are now, uh, they're not post machined um, out of forgings like they were for Rocket 3. Uh, they're now stamped out of sheet, and then those sheets are then welded into barrel sections. Uh, so much lower um, cost to produce and uh, much lower tack time. So we can ultimately scale all of these processes up uh, to a rocket a day should the market support that. Um, so you're seeing essentially the, uh, most of the rocket that you're looking at is the first stage tank. It's built the same way as the upper stage tank. Uh, common dome, just with a larger uh, transfer tube or downcomer, depending on the, the word you're familiar with using. Uh, some of the big changes that we have going on here uh, are in the thrust structure. So the thrust structure now has nodes. It has nodal points. Uh, those nodes are castings. Uh, and then we braze a tube, uh, a tube and, and casting braze joint. Um, so it's a strut system. You can't see it. It's all behind this shroud. Um, but there is one here. And you can see evidence by one of the nodes um, actually poking out uh, from beyond the thermal protection. Um, yeah, so we have the two engine configuration. Uh, we basically take the loads from these two engines and transmit them through struts to these nodes that you can see all the way around. There are six nodes, and those nodes are also, um, they double as uh, how we support the rocket uh, on the launcher itself. Well, there you have it. What an absolute treat to be able to wander around a rocket factory and learn about it from the people operating the machines and the people in charge. Thank you so much to Astra and CEO Chris Kemp VP of Manufacturing Bryson Gentili and all the other employees we talked to who not only shared their time but also their experience with us. If you liked the video, be sure to check out our previous factory tour of Astra which will really blow your mind in terms of how much things have changed. Alright, let us know what you thought of this one in the comments. We want to do some more of these so hopefully you like it. And uh, don't forget, be excellent to each other.